Let's build on that answer and talk about what works. And Dan, we'll start with you and then uh, go to you, Natalie. Uh, you know, uh, there are these there are these sort of massive debates. Uh, some people believe that what works is to focus on the root causes, things like poverty or inequality. Others say that focus solutions that identify and prioritize the highest risk places and in individuals are what we need to do. Um, in your experience, based on uh, based on the research that you've conducted yourself and that you're familiar with, you know, uh, what are the strategies that have been uh, demonstrated to be effective? Well, that's a difficult question because the the true, like the true true answer is that I don't know. Um, but because I think that that it's just um, not entirely. Uh, clear, you know, what the right mix of, of policies Are there is. emerging signals? Now, I, yeah, so, so, so th that said, I think that most of the evidence points to uh, focusing on places, people, and behaviors that are high risk of violence. I think that, and that most of that evidence comes from uh, primarily the U.S. Uh, some of it, a little bit comes from uh, from um, uh, from Latin America, not very much. Uh, however, there's also evidence that root causes are actually important, like unemployment. Uh, that's a, it's important inequality. There, 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 there are like we don't care for like cross country correlations anymore. We 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 are past that kind of uh, evidence. Uh, you know, we've been past that for for 20 years. Uh, but there there is rigorous evidence at the micro le level, um, evidence showing that inequality can, do it does increase uh, uh, violence. So and that, that's, a, that's a pressing question. Uh, does that, is that replicated in, in aggregate cross-country correlations? It turns out that it is. That's not the piece of evidence that I want to highlight. I want to highlight the fact that there are uh, you know, studies using credible uh, uh, causal studies showing the, the link between these two. So I think that these two, like targeted strategies uh, and uh, root cause strategies, so to speak, they are uh, not mutually exclusive. You can, um, I, th I think you need a portfolio of both, it's just like you need, you know, a mix of control and prevention strategies. Uh, um, in, in some ways, um, uh, I, I think this is this is where sort of the signals take us, but just to give you an example of how uh, carefully we need to take this discussion, especially uh, for example with the, with respect to to policing, uh, we just finished last year running the the largest randomized control trial ever done on hotspots policing. Uh, we did that in Colombia with uh, 750. Uh, treated hotspots uh, and uh, uh, about a thousand control hotspots, um, and we looked at crime in every street in the city. This is a this is a, a city that has a, a little over 136,000 blocks. Okay, so we looked at crime in every single one, um, and it turns out that yes, hotspots policing reduces crime at the hotspot, and. Uh, this, um, so this is great news, and for the most, like most of the literature f that comes from the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, suggests that crime uh, does not get displaced. Once you focus your policing, t your policing time uh, at the hot spot, uh, crime will not move around the corner. This is sort of the, the, this, the standing um, uh, sort of conventional wisdom at this point is that. Right. Okay? And just just for the audience, uh, if you don't know, a hotspot is a uh, a micro location, often just a small number of blocks where crime concentrates. That's what uh, hot. Right. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, in every city where this has been studied, uh, you see that there is an over concentration of crime in a very few fraction of the street of the str uh, you know city blocks. Okay. Um, so. This has been the pressing question, does crime displace or not? And our study is the first one that can actually credibly 
answer this question because of its scale. And it turns out that we actually do find uh, some displacement of property crime. So it turns out that when you look at the aggregate, even though there is a very small amount of displacement, because there are so many streets you know, to which uh, property crime can displace, it turns out that the aggregate effect citywide, you know, it turns out that it's not so clear that crime falls. And but if you look at violence, which is our topic today, it does seem to be the case that crime does not displace so much. So maybe the link between violence and place is stronger than the link between property crime and place. So this would be an argument for targeted, like geographically targeted strategies to reduce violence. But I think that just a, it just this whole discussion is very nuanced. We need we need to take it very carefully, and we need to, as I said before. Uh, build the evidence base from the ground in every context. Natalie. Um, uh, I think Daniel uh, brought very interesting uh, uh, point. I want to just to, uh, to add two elements. The first one that we really believe is that addressing the root causes with, uh, let's say, general social policies n does not always uh, work to reduce violence. Uh, let's take, for example, poverty. The last decade in Latin America, we reduced poverty from uh, 45 to 25 percent, but crime is still very high. Another example, and that I had the experience um, visiting two projects, one in Honduras and in Brazil with the Ur uh, urban upgrading projects. Uh, we improve the social services in those areas. We improve as well the infrastructure but crime and violence was still very high. So the lesson for that, and, and especially taking into account what Daniel said about um, the concentration of crime, and actually today we already say that is the law of concentration in, in people and in place. So we believe that the things that have been working is especially is policies that focus on security and vulnerable places geographically and on people. And when I say vulnerable people, it's women, youth, and children. So the general idea that we do with projects at the IBB is we pilot, we taste, we evaluate, and if that works, we help to upscale. And this is something that has uh, been working in different projects, and we see some results. Now going to the second part about uh, what works, uh, I agree, we don't have many evidence from Latin, America, uh, from Latin America, but we start having some of them that show some promising results. Let's take, for example, in social prevention. We, ha we know exactly that early child education has been showing some very important results in reducing aggression later in life. The problem with this type of, 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 of uh, intervention is the cost. As you know, it's very dedicated, it's one-to-one. -one. So this is something that even governments in Latin America are, are taking into account. But it's good evidence. It shows that changing behaviors is very important. For example, in, in, in terms of youth, um, uh, youth violence, we know that behavioral change are uh, having good results in terms of uh, uh, developing soft skills. And uh, we talked early with, with, with Thomas about not only the technical skills, but also the soft skills are very important for the reinsertion of prisoners later on in life. In terms of policing, you know, uh, Daniel already mentioned hotspot. We have mixed evidence. We did an evaluation in Uruguay. We didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, found displacement, but probably the, the, the it was in a, s a small scale. Um, but um, I think it is promising evidence in the whole spot. Um, in terms of technology, I wanted just to mention something. There is uh, the governments are very excited about buying cameras and buying uh, uh, also different toys. And we have some evidence for the cameras to work for a certain type of, of crime, and then we should know that. And not only buying camera because this is the way of, of showing that we're doing something in security, especially governments, but also is the human capital behind, behind those cameras. I had the experience in one country in Central America, and that was really not uh, very uh, comfortable. I was visiting one of the command, uh, the central command in one of those countries, and there were cameras um, everywhere, screens everywhere that were monitoring the crime and violence in the city. Suddenly, the, uh, the alarm start up, 
so there were some incidents somewhere. Then we couldn't locate which camera or which screen we were seeing the incident. And when we finally, after 10 minutes, you know, would look in another camera, exactly, this is what happened. You know, the incident was gone, and then they say, okay, let's zoom the, the license plate. We couldn't zoom the license plate. So that is it's just a simple example to show you that behind technology, we should put also a human capital that can be used. So good technology, but with the human capital that can use and, and take advantage of that. Right. I've been to uh, um, you know crime analysis centers in the United States where they have very sophisticated cameras uh, where uh, basically uh, they've got the cameras set up, the, the data is coming in, but there are no police officers to look at the data. So it's completely <laughs> useless just sitting there. Uh, and this goes to Daniel's point about implementation. It's not just <laughs> about choosing the right strategy, it's also about how you implement that strategy. 